So I do welcome you, and last week was back to school. We had a back to school event along with VBS and uh, just praying for a good school year. And so some of you had a week, a couple days, kind of back to school, getting back in the flow of things. And some of you are like, yes, right, uh, along with me. Um, back at school, uh, that's some routine. There's some schedule uh, that gets kind of uh, back in order. If you was kind of out of whack uh, doing the summer thing and all hours of the night, now there's routine back in school and um, a set bedtime and everybody waking up early hopefully going to bed early and then wake up early. Everybody's got places to go and places where you're supposed to be. And uh, what's always good for me with all of our kiddos, uh, school wears them out. And so that's a good thing. We found that out with Vacation Bible School. Last week it was great. Some of you might have saw the, the picture uh, Tony had of the grandkids. It was kind of before and after picture, before VBS. They were all wired up. Uh, bright-eyed, awake, ready to go, and then after vacation Bible school, they went to sleep in the car, right? And it's just wore them completely out, and that's the way it was with our McKenna. She started kindergarten, first time she's been to school all day, so all day kindergarten, and picked her up. She lights out. I mean, she was asleep by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Slept all the way to like 9 o'clock uh, that evening, but thankful for routine. And I kind of like routine. It's kind of predictable. You can kind of set a schedule. It's familiar. It's what we're used to. It's what we know. And so a lot of us are like that. We like the familiar, comfortable. And some of us can have a hard time when things change. Oh, and there's lots of people, right? It's just not just me, right? Things change. Things aren't the way that they're used to being, and things get mixed up, and sometimes we think that's just not right because we like things that are familiar, um, things that we know, things that we're used to. Obviously, that can happen at home, uh, we get used to seeing some things a certain way, doing some things a certain way, and then all of a sudden somebody changes that, and it's like, oh, that's not familiar. Somebody's changed that. Um, the Bible talks about laughter being good, right, good medicine and good for the soul. I've just got a few pictures, and then we'll move on from that. But if it's something funny, feel free. You don't have to. It's not going to force you to. might not be funny, but the laughter is good. It uh, just does a lot of good things for you. Um, but I thought about that at home. We get used to doing some things a certain way, and if they get changed by someone in the house, um, you instantly recognize that. And so I found some pictures um, that I wanted to go to, and I let me see here, um, this picture right there. Now, there's the picture on the right. How many of you would say, that's what I'm familiar with, and that's the right way to do that? Okay? That's the right way, right? That's just how it is. Now, how many of you would say the picture on the left is how you do that? Oh, nobody's going to do it. I was going to say, if it's, if it's on the, the, the cat owners are the one who do that on the left. They're the, pe the ones who have cats so they can play with that. Now, um, now, everybody knows that that's just wrong, right? Okay? Don't matter if you're left side or right side, that's just wrong. But what's worse than that is this, right? That right there is just lazy. Just lazy, brother. That's what I get told. You're just lazy. Right? So in, we get familiar with some things that we're used to. We're seeing, and hey, and if that gets out of, if something changes, we're like, oh. and sometimes those things can come be a big deal. I mean, that can become a big deal. 
young people who's just starting out in marriage, I need to counsel you for a while on stuff like that. You need to get this stuff settled and locked down, okay? Here's something else in your home that you need to be locked down on. Anybody get dispense their toothpaste like that? Like I do, you just squeeze it and stuff comes out. And if it goes on the counter, you just get your toothbrush and you just peel it up off the counter. If it's on the lid, you just smoosh it on the lid, right? Nobody going to agree to that? Okay, so everybody here does it like that, right? Nice and neat and clean, no problem, right? We get familiar with some things, and when things change, we can get freaked out by that. And it can become a big deal and cause problems in the home. I was told not too long ago, you have no idea how to load a dishwasher. I had no idea that there's a, there's a right way to load a dishwasher. Three people said amen. First time they said amen and for a long time, but you say amen to load in the dishwasher. That's all right. But, and so you follow the, right, the manufacturer's recommendation instructions on loading a dishwasher. I didn't know that was a thing, but apparently that's a thing. But again, familiar. And sometimes when things change like that, or ew, and they can become a big deal, We can do that in our relationships, Um, being familiar with one another. Um, Where you think you know the other person, you know what they're thinking, you know how they're going to react, you can finish the sentence for them, and you're so familiar with them but that could be a problem, right? That could be a problem <clears throat> because people change. We all change. And uh, so there's, you know, on one hand, familiarity is great. And there's routine. And it's what I know. And it's what I'm used to. And it's a good thing. Coming to church, right? This is familiar to us. We carve out a couple hours every Sunday, and we get together. It's familiar. The songs that we sing, familiar. Prayer time. You kind of know how things are going to go. We allow the Holy Spirit, hey, do what you want to do in this service, but there's some things that you can become familiar with. That's a good thing. Blessings come, but what I want to spend the rest of our time with, there's also some warnings with being so familiar with something that it loses power, that it loses um, its weightiness, and that everything just kind of becomes ho-hum, kind of going through the motions. There's that, there's, uh, that old saying that goes, familiarity breeds contempt. Right? You've heard that. You get so familiar, it's so commonplace to you um, that it causes problems. And we can see that, again, at home, in our relationships, but also in your spiritual life. That can become a problem. Things just too familiar. Oh, I already know that. I already know what God's going to do. You know, uh, I know all about prayer. Uh, And you can kind of fill in the blank spiritually with God and the things of God. And it can become, again, so commonplace and so familiar that we don't allow God to do anything different. And so that's why I think some people, it's just the same old, same old every day. Nothing changes. There's no power. There's no strength. There's nothing new because they already know everything. Everything's too familiar. A couple weeks ago on a Sunday night, I preached a message on uh, the 23rd Psalm. And everybody knows Psalm 23. It right? don't matter if you go to church or not, believer, unbeliever. Um, Psalm 23, just everybody knows it. And you hear today. I mean, it's just very familiar. Um, 
Some of you could recite that, right? The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want, and you could go through the whole psalm. And I mentioned that you can become so familiar with that specific psalm that it does. It loses its weightiness. It loses its power. And you can say, oh, I've already prayed that prayer before. Oh, I know what's in that psalm. I know it talks about rest and God's presence and he goes ahead. I know all about that. And it can lose the power behind that. And so that's the danger, that's the warning, that's the caution that that can creep into our spiritual life, uh, but it does not have to be that way, right? The familiar things should be good and rewarding and bring blessings and favor, and so don't let the familiarity of things around you rob you of the wonder of it all, even the people in your life, right? The, the, the wonder and the mystery and the blessings. Don't let being so familiar with those people and those things rob you of the wonder of it all. Every day is a new day, right? We talk about that new mercies I see every morning and we sing about how great is thy faithfulness. New things. Even in the familiar, we can celebrate and pause and be in awe of those things. I want to talk about where Jesus grew up in a city of Nazareth. I'm going to use that example in Luke chapter 4 today. Jesus' ministry in his hometown was limited because they were too familiar, I think, with Jesus and his family. Um, I think the city of Nazareth was guilty of that. I also think Jesus' half-brother James, and we'll talk a little bit more about James later, but I think he was guilty of that as well, just being too familiar with Jesus. He's family. He's hometown boy. We know about him. We know about his family. And they missed out because they believed that they knew everything about Jesus and his family. And really, you look at it, the city of Nazareth missed out. All the other cities that Jesus went to and taught and preached around Galilee, they saw miracle after miracle after miracle and was just blessed beyond measure. Not so much in Nazareth. Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, Verse 14 tells us that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And so he's in the synagogue and he's in his hometown and he's preaching. And verse 16 says this. And Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as it was his custom and he stood up to read. And, and he read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah it was handed to him, and he unrolled it, and he found the place where it's written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips, but... <laughs> Isn't this Joseph's son, they ask. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the, the carpenter's kid? And Jesus, of course, he knows what's in every heart, and he knows the motivation behind that. He could tell exactly what they were thinking. And he goes on in that passage, you can read that, but he goes on and he starts telling them about how um, a lack of faith will 
keep you from experiencing all that God has for you. Lack of faith will keep you from enjoying all the benefits and the blessings that God has for you. And they didn't like that very much. They didn't like what Jesus had to say about that. And so you go down to verse 28 and it says, And all the people were furious with Jesus. So furious with him that they took him to the edge of the cliff and they was wanting to throw him off throw him off the cliff, but Scripture says that Jesus walked through the crowd and then he left. Another passage in the Gospel of Mark tells about a time when Jesus, again in his hometown, same things going on, he's teaching, he's, he's been going from city to city, lands in his hometown, and there were many who heard him were amazed. But then verse 3, Mark chapter 6, verse 3, questions, Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? And then it says, and then they took offense at Jesus. And then Jesus said to him, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. And Jesus could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. And so again, familiarity with some things um, can cause us some problems. And there you had the people, his hometown, Jesus' hometown was so familiar with him, they missed out on a bunch of things. And so in your outline this morning, I would just start off with this, some, some observations about uh, being familiar with some things. And number one would be, um, familiar behavior assumes, okay? When you're familiar with some things, you just assume that you know everything about what's going on. The people of Nazareth assumed they knew who Jesus was. He's the carpenter's son. That's Joseph's boy. That's Mary's. That's, he's the carpenter, but Jesus is more than that. And he tried to explain that to him by reading the Old Testament, right, the prophecies, Today, all of that about the Messiah, the Anointed One, I'm fulfilling that today, and yet they thought they already knew everything. They assumed that because they were familiar with some things about God and who God was, that they knew it all. And so familiar behavior assumes, but it also misses out, and I think that's the result. That passage in Mark where the people in his hometown are like, hey, you're Joseph's kid, we know about you. Um, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except, right, except in his hometown, among his relatives and his own home. And he could do no miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And then it, again, Jesus amazed at their lack of faith. Everywhere else that Jesus went, Miracles happened. City after city, they would see healings and families brought back together, children coming to Jesus, people set free from sin and addictions. And, and so lives were being changed everywhere that Jesus and his disciples went. Blessings and favor were pouring out on all these people except Nazareth. And they just kept missing out. And part of that was they were so familiar with who they thought Jesus was and where he came from and his family. They thought they knew this hometown boy, but they just dramatically and really tragically underestimated what God was wanting to do, and they just missed out, 
and really made a mess of things, made a mess of things. And so those are two things that we don't want to follow. There's a better way. And again, being familiar with some things should be a blessing. And being familiar with some things, especially God's Word and the things of God, um, I think you have to have a clear faith. A clear faith. And a clear faith brings hope. Jim read that passage, the call of uh, worship passage this morning, Hebrews 11, chapter 1. That's really the definition of faith. Hebrews 11, right? Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And so a clear faith says, you know what? God, I don't know exactly how you're going to work this out. I don't even know if, you, if it's your will to work these things out and to answer this prayer, but I'm believing. I have faith. And, and my faith tells me that I know you can, you're able, right? God can do anything, nothing is impossible with God. And so my faith says, I have a clear faith because God, I know that you can do this. Don't know if you're going to, don't know even if you are going to, don't know how you're going to do it, but my faith says you can do this. And so I'm giving that over to you. And I ask that you help me to trust you, draw up as close as I can to you, and have this clear faith that's filled with hope. I'm, I'm hopeful for what's around the corner. God, you're working and you're moving and, and, and you're working in people and through people, and so I have hope that this prayer is going to be answered. And we see this all through Scripture, and we see this as Jesus moves from town to town, even in the Gospel of Luke. You go to the next chapter, Luke 5, and it talks about people who have this hope. There's a, there's a man with leprosy, and he goes up to Jesus, and he says to Jesus, you know, I know you can heal me. You have the power to heal me, but I just don't know if you want to or not was basically what this leper said to jesus and jesus said i will heal you and he heals the man from leprosy and so this leper has hope and then that hope turns into healing and then he praises god for the healing and i imagine that there were some people in nazareth who had leprosy and yet they didn't experience what this man experienced. And Luke's gospel will go on in five and talk about the, the man who was paralyzed, right? And his friends tear a hole in the roof. They lower their friend down where Jesus is teaching. And Jesus is amazed at their dedication and loyalty to this guy. And Jesus says to the, uh, to the man who's paralyzed, he says, your sins has been forgiven. And the religious leaders don't like that, and they take offense to that. And they say, how dare you tell this man his sins are forgiven? Only God does that. And yet Jesus says, which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to just say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Well, the paralyzed man, he believed that Jesus had the power to forgive sins, so he takes up his mat and he walks. And people begin to praise, and they're just blown away at the power of Jesus. And again, I'm sure people in Nazareth had people who were paralyzed, and yet they did not experience what this man did. So a clear faith hopes, a clear faith obeys. There was obedience there, and all of that, you look, people had open, open hands, they had open hearts, receptive to what... God wanted to do, and I'd say that's the same for us today, to be receptive to what God wants to do. Yeah, we want to be familiar with God's Word and the things of God and all the, the things that God's doing, but we also want to be ready with open hands and open hearts to receive maybe something new. Maybe God's wanting to do something new in your life. Maybe wants, God wants to do something different in your life. And so are you do you have open hands to receive that and open heart to say, okay, God, your will be done. 
whatever you want to do, count me in and help me to put my yes on the table. A clear faith obeys. And finally, a clear faith makes things new. And we'll kind of close with this last thought. Everything became new to the people. City after city, people after city, when Jesus was teaching and preaching, it all became new. New relationships, new opportunities, new friendships, new blessings, a new life to walk out when they would receive what Jesus had for them. And that's really what faith looks like. And I know I've talked a lot about healings and... and uh, uh, people missing out on getting that healing. Although the Bible does say that there were a few people, right, in Nazareth. There was a few sick people who got healed. Not very many, but a few. But that's still, that's a good thing. Right? I mean, if there were three people here today who got healed, you know, you were sick and you got to feeling better, we'd celebrate that and probably for a long time. And so that is a good thing, but of course that's not why Jesus came. He didn't just come to make you feel better, didn't come to make me feel better. He came to take us from death, we have no hope, to, to life. Take us from dead in our trespasses and sin to being alive in Christ. That's why he came set us free, rescue us, because we couldn't rescue ourselves, he came to take the sin of the world on him. And so that's really what it comes down to. Jesus is more concerned about where your faith is rather than if you get a healing or not. And Jesus gives everybody an opportunity to come to him in faith. Amen? Lots of opportunities, <clears throat> lots of second chances, third chances, four, five, six, anybody? Lots of chances, lots of opportunities to come to faith. I don't believe that, that God just gives you, you know, you got one shot, it's all up to you, right? You, it's too bad for you, you've blown it. No, God gives us lots of chances, and, and evidently, he continued to give Nazareth chances, and opportunities because we find out later on that there's a there's a church that gets birthed in Nazareth and lots of wonderful things begin to happen in that town and people's filled with faith and they share their faith and so that city got a second chance and there's somebody else in the story that got a second chance and it's James and I'll end with James, Jesus' half-brother. Scripture tells us that James was not a big fan of brother Jesus for a long time. And I think part of that is because he was so familiar <laughs> with Jesus. And I could almost imagine that in their home and outside, messing around, James telling Jesus, Jesus, you need to, you need to tone it down a little bit. Right. You're, you're saying some, some strange things here, you know. And James was not a believer. He wasn't a believer for a long time. After Jesus was arrested, crucified, was buried, and then he rose again, things began to change for James. For the church, churches begin to, 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 to pop up and begin to explode and they begin teaching and preaching the things of Jesus. And, I mean, just amazing things was going on. And there came a time when there were so many churches popping up. And remember, you had, you had a lot of different traditions, a lot of different uh, cultures coming together. You had... Jewish Christians and you had Gentiles coming in and they were all meeting in this churches together and the book of Acts in chapter 15 tell us that there were a lot of confusion that was going on and how to teach and preach the good news of the gospel right they had a lot of things right 
But there were some of that going on where, you know, what did Jesus say about this? How's the best way we should spread the good news of the gospel? What exactly is the gospel message? And there were some churches, they were saying, you know, um, you still need to, to follow these dietary uh, laws and you need to eat this and you need to drink this and you need to observe these, these, these holy days. You know, that's it. That's really what's going to get you right with God. If you, you have Jesus, but you also have some of this other stuff, some of these other rules that we've made up. Circumcision was a big thing, right? And so all of that together, and there was confusion until one day James, right? They're at the Council of Jerusalem, and they're, they're all coming together. How is it that we should present the gospel to the people? And James said, I'll tell you, this is how we're going to do it. Jesus is enough. Put your faith in Jesus. At some point, James went from, hmm, I was just too familiar with Jesus growing up to put all of your hope, all of your faith, all of your trust in this Jesus. He's enough. He's the one that's going to get you right. And so... From that point in Acts 15, for 2,000 years now, we've followed that advice. And the gospel message is, where's your faith? Is your faith in Jesus where it matters? And we continue to preach the good news of the gospel, that Jesus came, he died for our sin, we're hopeless without him. In every good thing that we have, every blessing, every favor, every good thing comes from Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy every day. Every day is a new day, and you have so many experiences that you want us to walk into. I just pray that you, have, that you help us to have the courage, the boldness, uh, the faith uh, to step into some of the things that you want to, to call us into, and that we would just let you have right of way in everything that we do, everything that we say, that we would just yield to the Holy Spirit, be surrendered. And so we thank you in advance for all your answers to prayer. Thank you for every family that's represented here. We love you. We ask that you continue to just move on our hearts and our minds. Guide, guard, and direct us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.